Uh, so I, I'm Dave Blunden. I don't know what he just said. I wasn't listening. Um, so you probably described me as a venture capitalist, which is what people do. Yep. I, it annoys the hell out of me because my entire life I've been a, a technologist. I went to school right here. I teach a class, a technological yeah. class right in this room. Uh, and I was one of the first. Uh, I was actually the only person on campus doing neural networks uh, when I was here uh, between uh, 1988 and 1991. Um, and uh, so now I get described as a venture capitalist. But it's come full circle because what we're investing in now is AI and the technology is basically just a dramatically bigger, much faster version of what we were doing back then. Um, I don't know if you saw this slide earlier today, anyone? I know Jeremy didn't, so I'm going to share it again. Uh, this is just the remarkable acceleration of the compute going into these large AI models. And the entire time, so my time here was there. Uh, I worked on it in here. Actually, Jan LeCun, who I'll be interviewing at 3 o'clock or 3.30, I guess, uh, was working on OCR, so handwriting recognition, the same time that I was. And actually, relied heavily on his research. So I'm going to have to thank him for that later today. But um, you know, we had uh, maybe a million parameters in our neural nets now. Now they have a trillion. They're going to 10 trillion in the next year or so. And then there'll be 100 trillion about three years from now. Uh, so just massive scale increase. But uh, the, the commercial use cases are more or less you know, spread across this chart fairly evenly. And we're punching through those commercial use cases very, very quickly now. The acceleration right here comes entirely from mapping the neural nets onto GPUs. So nowadays, we run them on these things. Um, this is Jensen Huang. NVIDIA now is the third most valuable company on the planet. Uh, we started talking about NVIDIA in class, I guess, two years ago. If anyone in the room was listening and bought the stock, they'd be up uh, probably 20, 30x by now. Uh, this is the um, H100. And this will be out this summer. It's the B100. There's 200 billion transistors on this chip. Uh, and it's very much laid out in a neural network kind of way. Many, many, many little processing units that are independently on there. So if I take this slide, if I can go back, and I move it to not a logarithmic chart, just a linear chart, this is what the compute training on the, on the y-axis here, this is the amount of compute going into training the single largest neural network model you know, that, that's in the community right now. And this is uh, 2024, 2025. And so I think people are getting blindsided by what's possible uh, on a pretty much a weekly or monthly basis. Did anyone try Udio last week when it came out? Can, a couple people in the room? Were you blown away? I mean, you can make virtually perfect music in any genre. But what they got right versus just a few months ago is the voices are spectacular. And I was like, how is that possible? So it's getting very, very difficult to predict what's next. And it's going to get more difficult at 6 o'clock this evening. The Liquid AI team is going to be on stage. I don't know what they're going to be willing to disclose about their technology. But I can tell you that we're all in for orders of magnitude increases in what's possible in a less than two year, probably more like one year time frame. So we'll, we'll see what they're, what they're willing to say. Um, so when you talk to ARK Invest, Kathy Wood, about what this implies for the global economy, this is their analysis. So we're going to add about $20 trillion to the global economy in a very compressed time window because of AI. So that's on the purple, purple line on the far left. You compare that to all technical innovations in history. And I would have expected the internet to be kind of by far the next thing on the chart. The internet shows up kind of buried in information technology over here. And then down at the left side, you have industrial robots uh, in here, adaptive robotics, which is, what do you know, 2023 to 2030. It's actually the same timeline that we're living in right now. Uh, and then the second biggest thing on the chart here is the steam engine. So that gets me thinking, you know, if you look at it over a long timeline, like where are we in the history of the world right now? Uh, what is this shocking moment we're living in? And this is what it looks like over time. So here's the steam engine. And what jumps out at me about the steam engine is there's not much going on before the steam engine. Then suddenly a lot happens. But that's the only thing going on. Like, there's only one color in this. What are we doing now? We're doing the steam engine. Get rid of the horses. We're, we're putting steam engines everywhere. So you go forward in time, and you get these concurrences. And it would have been amazing to live in this little era or this little era right here, where you have railroads, tele, uh, the telegraph, photography, and bicycle all come out at the same time. You think, wow, this is a lot of change going on. I think nothing like we live today, but it's a lot of change going on. 
this is an amazing time frame in here too. I won't, I won't belabor it. But you know, you've got electricity, telephone, radio, all during this very narrow window. And then you get these spots where there's innovation and technology moves forward. And this is what I'm always telling the students in class here. Depending on what year you graduate, it makes a massive difference in your life, I mean, just an overwhelming difference. And the people graduating today are graduating right into this firestorm. But you could have graduated right here when there's not much going on. You probably would have worked at DuPont, DuPont as an entry-level engineer, and you know, 10 years later, you'd be like, you, know, you have a dog and suburban house, or whatever. But you're growing into, into this. Um, so well, the other thing that kind of surprises me on here is the integrated circuit, you know, the invention of the microchip which is in here, but when you really think about it, if some of the speakers on stage, like you know, the head of investments at Citibank, like, yeah, we've tried the LLMs. Um, they're good at some things, they're not good at other things. Like, okay, well, the fact that you are even trying them is pretty remarkable compared to the invention of the integrated circuit, which probably sat here in the labs at MIT for maybe a decade before anyone in a bank would even think about having a, a, a conversation about it. So the reason the integrated circuit didn't drive this kind of instantaneous change is because it took forever. And it's still, it's still taking forever to reach its full 200 billion transistors on a chip kind of scale. So here you got the PC, which is also relatively slow by today's standards, the internet. And now you've got concurrently all this going on, just a massive amount of innovation concurrently, and AI being by far the biggest piece of it. But this little dip right here is really interesting to me because people don't really think about it, but this article came out in Forbes recently. Right now, there are no self-made billionaires under the age of 30, none. It's the first time in 15 years that that's been true. And it's because we've been in this dry spot where Mark Zuckerberg is growing and you know, the, the prior wave of self-made billionaires are growing but nothing really big and disruptive has happened. Now all these companies presenting are gonna, are gonna break that mold. This is what a not self-made billionaire looks like, by the way, in case you're, in case you're curious. <laughs> it's, it's Forbes, not me. Um, so when you, when you zoom in on it, uh, you know, the AI dominates it, and this chart really jumps out at me. Uh, this is a chart uh, where you say, well, what technologies affect what other technologies? And there's a lot on here. Um, so, what I really want to point out, though, is the, the neural network column in the middle here. It is so foundational. The only real analogy in history to what's happening right now is the invention of the internet, which is very foundational, but it doesn't really touch every aspect of everything we do. It, but it touches a lot. The AI-driven neural network literally touches everything else we do other than cryptocurrency. It has no connection to cryptocurrency. But other than that, it drives change in everything else we do. And I mentioned earlier today uh, this company, Tailbox, uh, which they're here today. Uh, they have this, uh, did I, does everybody already know the Tailbox story? It's a AI, no, no, okay. Well, so they were actually in this classroom uh, in AI for Impact, and they said to the class, we're gonna build by the end of the semester a tour guide for graduation. It's gonna be an AI tour guide, and the parents coming here for graduation are gonna be able to put their AirPods in and walk around campus. And everywhere they move, it's going to use geolocation to figure out where they are. It's going to tell them what happened at that spot on the planet. And more importantly, you can talk back to it. And you can say, I care a lot more about physics than I do about biology. Can you just tell me about physics? So it changes the tour to match your interests as you interact with it. It can speak in any language. Um, and uh, we're going to get that out on graduation day. Like, wait, the two of you are going to build that by graduation day. And they did. And they did, and they became a funded company right after that. Um, but what really blew me away was I, I ran into them over in Kendall Square, and they said, hey, Dave, we've got to show you something. We added a tour, a tour spot uh, on, the, on the pathway here, and it's where you founded your first company. I was like, OK. And they said, and it's in your voice. It's you telling the story in your own voice. I said, where'd you get my voice? They said, we just scraped it off the internet. I said, OK. <laughs> so I, they put a headset on me. and. and the, the story that it told was perfectly accurate. It was dramatically better than what I would have said. I mean, it dug up facts that I had long since forgotten, wove it into a beautiful little story. It's like, oh my god. And it, they said it took less than 15 minutes to add that tour stop. It's like, OK. Now I can see where this puck is going. This is just, just too exciting. But my point with this is that that business model, first of all, two people getting that done in a semester is mind-blowing. But that's what's possible today. But it also requires the, converg the convergence of voice recognition technology, voice synthesis in other voices, translation, 
LLMs so that it has an intelligent dialogue with you, and geolocation, which we've had for a while, and probably a couple of other things that I'm not thinking of right now, all coming together concurrently for those two students to turn that into a company in a single semester. So that's the kind of con convergence that's being driven by this technology. So that was my only message today. I appreciate the time.